I'd also like to mention that this uh, presentation will be taking place uh, Wednesday night, the day after tomorrow, at the Dreyfus University Center in Stevens Point at the UW there. And uh, if you know any people down that way that might be interested, uh, please pass it along. Uh, there's two booths out front. Uh, one is the Cornucopia Climate Coalition, and we've got a sign-up sheet. Uh, the uh, Citizens Climate Lobby also has a presence out front. Do, do stop and uh, say hi to them as well. Um, and tonight's presentation will be followed by a question and answer period. Uh, it will be as lengthy as, as needed. You've got the facility until something like 9 o'clock, so uh, plenty of time for a little discussion after uh, Dr. McPherson's presentation. So with uh, those announcements said, I'll introduce uh, Dr. McPherson. He's an internationally recognized speaker, award-winning scientist, and leading authority on abrupt climate change, leading to near-term human extinction. He is Professor Emeritus at the University of Arizona, where he taught and conducted research for over 20 years. And so without further delay, I, I'll go ahead and introduce uh, Professor Nikki Pearson. Thank you, Kurt. Thanks to the Cornucopia Climate Coalition for hosting me. Thank you all for coming. Thanks to Phil, who's the only one who brought me a present. No guilt, no shame. But really, there's 175 of you. I don't yet know whether it's explosives. Maybe I shouldn't say thank you. You know this guy, right? So I've been sounding this alarm for more than six years in public presentations, and as you might imagine, I've been largely ignored. Actually, that would be too polite. For the most part, I've been libeled and slandered and been the subject of character defamation. This is one of my favorite misquotes. It's been used so much since I penned it in May of 2009, that now people are starting to take credit for it that I've never even heard of. The character defamation began early, in fact, towards the end of my career at the University of Arizona when my dean and department head both libeled me. That wasn't very polite. KMO, the podcaster, Kevin Michael O'Connor, was an early adopter of the idea, and that's why he was hosted on Radio EcoShock by Canada's favorite environmental radio guy. The Guardian chimed in later, and it's interesting. For many years, I strived to be written about in the New York Times because I thought that would be a measure of success based on my scientific work if I made the New York Times. I thought that would be cool. And then I realized that wasn't gonna happen, so I gave up on the idea. And my goal then was to die, I mean, that's, let me rephrase that. <laughs> my goal then was to have my life end in a really interesting way so that I would be featured in the New York Times. I don't know what that way would be, but I know that you have to die crazy or be famous on your death to make it into the New York Times. That didn't happen, but finally, finally the New York Times came along and started calling me names like so many other people do. The Washington Post is among the latest where Michael Mann and two colleagues referred to me as the Dumas cult hero. I'm a Dumas cult hero, according to the Washington Post. That's pretty amazing, really. They got it wrong, of course. I'm a Dumas cult superhero, which is a whole different thing. <laughs> Whatever. Most of us are familiar with the idea of gradual climate change, the Al Gore inconvenient truth style of climate change that has the global average temperature increasing ever so slightly decade after decade. And that's not what I'm going to talk about. That's really important because if we project forward and at the time this projection was made, the paper was published in 2013, so it was written in 2012 or earlier, 
at this point, all we really knew based upon the scientific literature was this gradual version of climate change. And even at that, notice that niche evolution would need to occur 10,000 times faster than rates that are typically observed among vertebrate species. We're vertebrates. So projecting forward to 2100, which is everybody's favorite thing to do, indicates that gradual change would outstrip the ability of vertebrates to keep up by a factor of 10,000 times. So even at gradual rates of climate change, vertebrates have a very difficult time keeping up with changes in habitat. We're now in the midst of abrupt climate change, a phenomenon with precedence in planetary history, albeit not with humans involved. We've been warned. Noel Brown, the director of the United Nations Office of the United Nations Environment Program, the director of the New York Office of the UN Environment Program, sorry, said we have 10 years to solve this whole greenhouse gas problem, and that was in 1989. And, and this follows George Perkins Marsh, ambassador and naturalist from the 1840s, giving a similar warning. It follows Svente Arrhenius's work. He went on to win the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for unrelated work. In the Referee Journal literature in, the April of eight, in April of 1896, when he warned about the greenhouse effect. This comes after the 1983 conversation on the floor of the United States Congress between Carl Sagan and Al Gore, the conversation about we're headed for a really dire future if we don't do something. That was 1983. It's not as if we haven't been warned we have. And not long after, a little more than a year after a single individual working for the United Nations makes this statement, the United Nations Advisory Group on Greenhouse Gases, a body put together specifically to study the idea, indicates that the absolute upper limit is one degree Celsius above the 1750 baseline. Beyond which, global average temperature changes might elicit rapid, unpredictable, and nonlinear responses, which sounds a lot like self-reinforcing feedback loops to me, that could lead to, and this is very important, extensive ecosystem damage. The United Nations Advisory Group on Greenhouse Gases knew that we are human animals. They knew that we are subject to environmental constraints the same as every other organism on the planet. And so this group indicates that at or beyond one degree Celsius, things are gonna start falling apart for us. Climate writer and speaker David Spratt comes along many years later and says, we probably triggered these self-reinforcing feedback loops, these rapid, unpredictable, and nonlinear changes, somewhere between a quarter and half a degree Celsius. So they have already begun. I documented 69 of them before I just stopped keeping track more than two years ago. And I'd like to throw in things like this now and then because what I'm talking about is not a lot of fun. It's not even fun for me. Every time I'm done with a presentation like this, I spend the next 24 hours ranting about how I hate what I do. And all people on earth for their response to what I do. <laughs> Except you people, of course. And, and so I throw in an occasional cartoon. Some people think that's terribly flippant, and I'm sorry for that, but no, I'm not. Screw you. <laughs> I, just, I just, I can't get through this without a little humor now and then. The United Nations Advisory Group on Greenhouse Gases knew about habitat. You can tell when they include the phrase extensive ecosystem damage that they know that we're human animals. What is habitat? Habitat, according to my buddies Miriam and Webster, is the place or environment where a plant or animal normally lives, near, normally lives and grows. I'm a conservation biologist. The three pillars of conservation biology are speciation, 
when and with what predecessors a new species comes into existence. Homo sapiens, that's us, came into existence with a ha handful of other Homo species that had already gone extinct as of a couple hundred thousand years ago. Extinction, when the last individual of a species disappears or dies, so those are two of the three pillars, and perhaps most importantly, habitat. I'm using this simple definition. There are entire courses taught at the university level about what habitat is, but this is going to do for now. I use a couple of examples, a couple of counter examples actually. Human beings can live for a time on the International Space Station in nuclear submarines at McMurdo Station in Antarctica and none of these is habitat. None of these locations, none of these places represent locations where humans normally live and grow. We can survive there, but only because everything we need to survive in those locations is brought in. We can survive on the International Space Station, but only because we have Earth. Only because we have the ability to grow food here and take it to the International Space Station. And Tang isn't that great anyway, by the way. <laughs> Human animals have persisted on planet Earth for this long. This is the last two billion years of planet Earth's existence in the temperature that has occurred the global average temperature that has occurred in that two billion years. And according to James Hansen in a legal brief filed about three years ago, we've been here up to about two degrees Celsius above the 1750 baseline. We do fine with ice ages, 12 degrees Celsius global average temperature, 54 degrees Fahrenheit. That's ice age, that's the, the bottom, that's the lowest temperature that the Earth has experienced in the last two billion years. And so far, Homo sapiens has persisted during the Eemian period up to right there. Our species is 300,000 years old, which isn't much compared to the two billion years, the last two billion years of planet Earth, much less the 13.8 billion year old universe that we inhabit. It makes us seem rather insignificant when you put us into this little tiny box. So this is the human experience at least with respect to Homo sapiens. So today we're right here where the blue line is. We're at 1.73 degrees above the 1750 baseline. And Sam Carana projects a temperature by 2026 above that green line. I did some adjustments and I think made his estimate more conservative than he started with and ended up with that green line which is right between the most common temperature experienced by Earth in the last two billion years, right between there, 22 degrees Celsius and 23 degrees Celsius, the hottest, the hottest temperature experienced by Earth in the last two billion years. That temperature, the 23 degrees Celsius, coincided with what's called the Great Dying, the worst of the mass extinction events, the third of six mass extinction events in planetary history, when the global average temperature went from ice age to just beyond hothouse, up to 23 degrees Celsius, in a span of somewhere between about 900 and 19,000 years. We weren't keeping very good track of calendars and records and temperature back then, so we don't know exactly how long that occurred. But somewhere between 880 and 18,800 years of temperature increase from here to there and was responsible for more than 90% of the species on the planet going extinct. What are we doing in comparison? Today, the rate of temperature rise is about 10 times the rate it was during the Great Dying. And no big surprise, we're driving to extinction species at about 10 times the rate we did during the Great Dying 252 million years ago. 
So this is the most profound change we have ex that Earth has experienced in the last two billion years. So it's not as if we haven't been warned. That's my point here with this bloated introduction. And our response to those warnings looks a lot like this. And don't get me wrong, that's me, the third guy. This guy, what you don't see is that mostly in my life I have one, one foot over the edge and the other foot on a banana peel. We're, we're right there now as a species. What kind of change are we talking about? The Paleocene, Eocene thermal maximum when the global average temperature of the planet increased five degrees in 13 years, five degrees Celsius in 13 years, looks like this. And when we look back at the paleoclimatological records, that's about as fast as it gets. That's a very, very rapid change. It's not quite as fast as the increase in temperature coming out of the last ice age, termination of the last glacial age, and it's nowhere nearly as fast as what we've been doing since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution up till 2016. Since 2016, this number has steepened a little bit. The closest thing we're doing now is an asteroid impact. <laughs> That's the closest comparison we can make to the planetary heating since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. We're really that good. We're the asteroid. We're also the dinosaurs. We get to play a whole bunch of roles in this whole thing. I want to talk about a couple of paradoxes. First, there's the paradox that civilization is a heat engine driving us to extinction. And if we terminate civilization, if we turn off the heat engine that is civilization, we heat up the planet even faster. So you think this is impressive. You ain't seen nothing compared to what happens when we turn off the switch of civilization. I'll talk about that in more detail shortly. The second paradox is that geoengineering must be employed according to more than 80% of the scenarios employed by the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, in their latest assessment. Geoengineering must be used, pure and simple. We're beyond the point at which we can fix this by changing light bulbs and switching to electric cars. We can't paint the roofs of school buses white. We can't paint the buildings white. We're too far down this road. We must geoengineer the planet, which of course won't work. That's the paradox. And in fact, well, I'll go into each of these paradoxes in a little bit more detail. Only collapse of civilization prevents warming with climate change. This according to the work of Tim Garrett, a very brave man, now the department head of the Atmospheric Sciences Department at the University of Utah. But he was an associate professor when his first paper was written in 2007, submitted to 10 different journals, turned down by all of them, finally accepted by the prestigious journal Climatic Change. I think primarily because the editor of that journal was on his deathbed, Stephen Schneider. Stephen Schneider, a very brave man, looked at the reviews that came back on that first paper pointing out that civilization itself is a heat engine no matter how it's powered. Civilization itself is a heat engine. So Stephen Schneider looks at the evidence, looks at the reviews, says, yeah, there's no counter arguments. Civilization is a heat engine. There's been at least two papers subsequently that support this view. But, Paper was published November 2009 online. Immediately there was an outcry from academic scientists because you're telling me civilization is bad? But I work at a university. I'm among the most civilized people on the planet. You can't tell me this is bad. I like wine. I like cheese. I like tea for breakfast in the morning. You can't tell me this is bad. So the paper was pulled from publication and finally printed in February 2011 only with two other papers written by two research groups pointing out that they disagreed with Garrett's conclusions. The evidence was never questioned. The evidence is unimpeachable. 
Civilization is a heat engine based on the laws of thermodynamics. They are not, I repeat, not the strong suggestions of thermodynamics. They are the laws of thermodynamics. Nobody has ever taken issue with this idea. Garrett has subsequently published at least two other papers further supporting this idea. So only the collapse of civilization prevents runaway climate change. And now for the bad no news, Collapse of civilization causes the temperature to rise even faster. What? How can that be? We know about greenhouse gases. We know that industrial activity puts greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, such as carbon dioxide and water vapor and chlorofluorocarbons and methane, some 40 others. But in addition, industrial activity puts aerosols into the upper atmosphere and those aerosols act as an umbrella to prevent the sunlight from ever reaching the Earth and then trapping the long wave, radia long wave radiation with the greenhouse gases. So even before the light strikes the Earth, it is blocked by what's sometimes called the aerosol masking effect. These aerosols are produced primarily by burning coal you burn coal, especially the bad coal. You know, we have something called clean coal now. What an oxymoron. If, if it's unclean coal, which it almost all is, then it's high in sulfur. The lower the sulfur content, the cleaner it is. So the unclean coal, which is most of it, has sulfur. When you burn it, it produces sulfates, and these sulfates are the primary aerosols that are blocking incoming radiation. And whereas the initial paper on the topic in December 2011 by James Hansen and colleagues indicates a global average temperature rise of 1.2 plus or minus 0.2 C when we get rid of the aerosol masking effect, a later paper indicates that temperature will increase 1 degree C with as little as a 35% reduction in industrial activity. Well, pragmatically, we can divide up industrial activity on this planet into three big boxes. It's pretty close to Europe, the United States, and China, each accounting for approximately 30%, 25 to 30% of the industrial activity. So we get rid of any one of those, and we're talking about a profound rise in temperature in about six weeks' time. Six weeks. Six weeks, think about that. Our results suggest that adaptation to projected changes, gradual linear changes, over the next 100 years would require rates that are largely unprecedented 10,000 times faster than vertebrates can keep up over 100 years. We're talking about six weeks. Even if it's six months, even if it's six years, most likely it's a single growing season, a single growing season and every plant and every animal out there that depends upon plants, which is all of them, is well adapted to a particular temperature regime and a particular precipitation regime. When you change that regime in six weeks, you change everything. That's the kind of change that comes with, with for example, the collapse of 2016, Tom Hartman wrote about in his eponymous book, which didn't come in 2016. I think Tom Hartman is not wrong. I think he's ahead of his time with this topic as he is with so many others. So it could come this September or October, which is when the big financial crashes typically occur, all the way back to 1929. So that could happen and could cause the loss of habitat virtually immediately. This could happen as a result of an ice-free Arctic as well, and I thought we were headed for an ice-free Arctic very, very soon. In fact, I thought it would happen last year or this year, but it looks like we're not on track for that, and that would almost certainly destroy civilization. We'll get to that shortly. It isn't Tom Hartman alone who is making these observations. It was a Pentagon in 2017 indicating that the American financial system hovers on the brink 
And this paper from New Scientist, this issue of New Scientist titled The Collapse of Civilization, it's more precarious than we realize, came out the first week of April 2008. Most of us here know what happened in fall of 2008, the global financial crisis. So it certainly is more precarious than we realized. And then we realized it six months later. The whole house of cards teeters on the brink. So there's the first paradox. Civilization is a heat engine that has already overheated the planet. And if we turn off civilization, we heat the planet even faster. Oh, how inconvenient. So people very, very frequently tell me, tell me first of all, during the Q&A after my presentations, they tell me that they have not given up and that clearly I have and that we need to take action, radical action right now. And I point out that I haven't given up and that I don't even know what that means. What kind of radical action? When I realized that civilization was a heat engine long before Tim Garrett did, in 2007 I started establishing a homestead for myself to encourage people to dump civilization. Because it's a heat engine that's driving us to extinction. It couldn't have been more clear. It took me three years to find the location. So in 2004 I started preparing to live off grid and get rid of civilization. And I thought a whole bunch of people would follow along. You can laugh now, it's okay, I'll turn my back. <laughs> you know, people think of professors as being smart. I just gave you the counter example, the only one you'll ever need. I thought people would follow along. <laughs> oh, that's just crazy. Fortunately, they didn't. We didn't know about the aerosol masking effect in 2007 or even 2009. We only found out about it really in late 2011. And that's when I began to realize it's probably not a good idea for all those people to follow me off grid because then the planet heats up even faster than it otherwise would have. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. The second paradox, Global warming is irreversible with a massive geoengineering in the atmosphere's chemistry. This comes from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change with their 2014 assessment leaked in September 2013 and officially released in 2014. As pointed out first by Truthout and later by more prestigious bodies, this is fantasy technology. There is no known means to massively geoengineer the atmosphere's chemistry. We don't know how to sequester carbon from the atmosphere at a large enough scale to make a difference. It's absolutely necessary and it can't be done. It's not just truth out. Ultimately, it's the United States National Academy of Sciences, a fairly prestigious organization, by the way, and also a European body of similar stature both of them in 2015. Despite the clear evidence, and both of these bodies collated an enormous amount of evidence from the Refer Journal literature, despite that evidence, even James Hansen and colleagues conclude in 2017 that there is a requirement of negative CO2 emissions. We have to do it. It's impossible, we know, we got that. It's impossible, it can't be done, but we have to do it anyway. Doing the impossible is hard. I frequently understate my conclusions. I think actually this is downright unfair of Hanson and colleagues to call this the young people's burden. James Hansen's generation and mine were the worst in the history of the planet. I'm perfectly willing to shoulder that burden myself. It is not the young people's burden. You can't tell a 20 year old, you cannot tell 20 year olds that they need to fix the problem that we created. That's unfair. 
Requirement for negative CO2 emissions? Requirement? James Hansen says that you need to fix this. This is a real mess. He wrote a book published in 2007 called Storms on My Grandchildren, and now he's telling his grandchildren, you gotta fix this or I might die young. There's two paradoxes. That's not bad enough. We're in the midst of the sixth mass extinction on planet Earth. Gerardo Sabias et al., conservation biologists, by the way, each of them, reported in 2015, more than a decade after several conservation biologists had written books pointing out that we're in the midst of the sixth mass extinction, finally the refereed journal literature catches up in 2015 and says, sure enough, we're entering the sixth mass extinction. In an interview coincident with the release of the paper, the senior author Sabio says life would take many millions of years to recover. Of course it would, as it has with each of the previous five mass extinction events. And our species itself, that's Homo sapiens sapiens, the doubly proclaimed doubly wise ape. <laughs> Homo sapiens sapiens means wise. Really? Such hubris. Would, we, would likely disappear early on? Well, we haven't, clearly. The United Nations Environment Program in a report released August of 2010 concludes that we're driving to extinction 150 to 200 species every day. Every day for the last eight years. And we're not gone yet, so clearly we'll not be among the first to disappear. But because we are very complex organisms that depend upon many, many, many other organisms and ecosystem processes, we gotta go at some point. You can't kill all the filter feeders that clean our water. You can't kill all the pollinators that pollinate the food. You can't kill all those things, all those little things that we don't pay any attention to and we think that don't matter. You can't kill all of them and get off scot-free. It's not gonna happen. Two years later, Sabios again, the senior author, this time with a different mix of co-authors, describes the fact that we're in the midst of the sixth mass extinction. It's an ongoing sixth mass extinction. I love the first two words of the title. Biological annihilation. Bear in mind, folks, that the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of the United States is among the most conservative scientific publications and among the most prestigious you can find. They do not, this is not the National Enquirer, and they're using the term biological annihilation. This is shocking. I've been writing refereed journal papers for a long time. I have dozens of them to my credit. You don't get away with language like this. No journal uses the term biological annihilation. Let's back this up a little bit and see the kind of title that we usually observe in the refereed journal literature. It's not even readable. It's not even comprehensible. I don't even know what the hell it means. Accelerated modern human-induced species losses? The fuck is that? <laughs> and then, 24 months later, biological annihilation, you're all gonna die. This I understand. Seriousness. Classic scientific terminology. <laughs> Biological annihilation. Yeah, that's serious. Just like you wear shoes that are four sizes too small and you say, yeah, they're a little tight. The final sentence of this paper paints a dismal picture of the future of life, including human life, so they know. Conservation biologists know what's going on in the world and they know that we're in the midst of the Sysmax extinction and that the odds of us surviving are stunningly low. And I have bad news too. <laughs> Sorry withholding for withholding on you this whole time. The refereed journal literature is very, very conservative. The scientific process is very conservative. That's why it has become so dependable is because it's very conservative. You don't get from point A to point B without jumping through a million different hoops and convincing some really skeptical people based on evidence that point A to point B makes some sense. 
This is a conservative process conducted by conservative people. The most conservative of the referee journal literature sources are the annual reviews. There are a few dozen of these. One of them is the annual review of Earth and Planetary Sciences in a 2012 paper called The Future of Arctic Ice. Maslowski and colleagues, three of the four employed at the time by the U.S. Naval Postgraduate College. Not exactly a bunch of liberal left-wing hippies, by the way. Concluded that one can project that we will have an ice-free Arctic, what they call nearly ice-free Arctic Ocean, 2016, plus or minus three years. This little graphic here changes and shows the amount of ice volume in the Arctic Ocean from 1979 when satellite records began through 2018, through approximately today. And so this thing moves every year as the year changes as it goes up over time and ends up in 2018 somewhere down here. And I thought that we were headed for an ice-free Arctic this year. I thought that last year as well. Last year, we ended up at the annual minimum. It occurred about 10 days earlier than normal, about September 10th, instead of coincident with the vernal equinox in the Northern Hemisphere. And this year, based on the early part of the melt season, it, I'm surprised we didn't have an ice-free Arctic already. A projection from July 6th indicated that the ice would all be gone in the Arctic Ocean within 20 days, by July 26th. Well, here we are, August 13th, I think, and it didn't happen yet. And now it appears, based on a projection from the U.S. Navy last week, I think three days ago, it appears that the, the minimum this year approximately coincident with the vernal equinox, will be about 4 million square kilometers of ice in the Arctic. Probably will set a new record low, breaking the record from 2012, but the nearly ice-free Arctic projected by Maslowski and colleagues is really zero to a million square kilometers of Arctic ice. Not because scientists are so stupid they can't distinguish between zero and a million, but because at less than a million square kilometers, it's hard to keep track. There's a little bit tucked in a bay here and in a cove there, and it's floating around over there. So it's, there's, there's basically a calibration problem with those relatively small ice flows at that point. So, the scientific consensus is that an ice-free Arctic is analogous to one million square kilometers or less of ice in the Arctic. And it looks like we're headed, based on the latest projection I've seen, for about four million square kilometers. So, that said, the U.S. Navy analysis from last week also indicates that more than 99% of the ice is less than a meter thick. And when satellite records begin in 1979, almost all the ice was more than three meters thick. It was more than three and a half meters thick. So less than one meter is, pardon the pun, treading on thin ice. So you see after about 2000, it starts to deep, dip pretty significantly and ends up 2018 so far is about right here. And it looks like we're headed for a number of about right here based on the latest projections which looks pretty dire, but at least it ain't zero, or even a million or less. That said, the Siberian Arctic Shelf, where Natalia Shkova and her research team have done an enormous amount of research, is looking really, really wide open right now. And as I understand it, that's the largest continental shelf in the world. According to the president of Finland, dating back to nearly a year ago, and he said this, he's made similar statements many times over the course of the last 11 months, if we lose the Arctic, we lose the globe. That is reality. And what he means by this, if we lose the ice in the Arctic Ocean, we lose habitat for humans on planet Earth. I already talked about habitat. We are human animals. We depend upon a large number of other organisms for our survival. And the Arctic is the planetary air conditioner. If we lose the air conditioner, it gets really uncomfortably hot, too hot to 
grow grains at large scale, thus the civilization collapse. That leads to, because of a lack of global dimming, a more rapid rise in global average temperature. And so we have these knock-on effects, none of which are good. So, now what? I just reminded you, and it took a really long time to do it, of something you've known since you were 12. Because you're all reasonably intelligent human beings. You knew you were going to die when you were 12. I discovered it when I was 11. I remember it quite clearly. My grandmother died. I knew up until that point that everybody dies, except me. But when my grandmother died, I barely even knew the woman, by the way. When she died, it occurred to me within a matter of months that the reason I was crying was not for her, her who I barely knew, but for me. Mortality meant me, too. I hated that idea. So how do we live with a terminal diagnosis? I think this is pretty good, or I wouldn't have put it up there on the screen. I think we're in hospice at the planetary level for our entire species. And I haven't experienced, I haven't been around a lot of people who were in hospice. So I don't have a lot of experience with this. But as nearly as I can tell, almost nobody when they're in hospice says things like, I should have bought more stuff. Another seven pair of shoes, I'd have been a happy person on my death. I think that's not right. I think most people when they're in hospice try to fulfill the dreams they've had regarding relationships, not acquisitions, not getting their passport stamped, but coming to grips with the relationships in their lives. Maybe we should start doing that now. Maybe that would make us more joyful, more joy-filled people. I am not by any means proposing inaction. After every one of these presentations, somebody in the audience says, I'm more hopeful than you. I think we can still do things. I think we can still do things too. I think none of those, those things will improve the prospects for there being human beings on Earth beyond 2025 or so. But I still think there are things we should do. Things that people do when they're in hospice, for example. Start treating other people with respect and dignity. Maybe even do that for ourselves. Take seriously the serious things instead of the treadmill that we jump on every day that we call work. And I'm not suggesting that everybody walk away from their jobs, by the way. I am suggesting that if you're spending 70 hours a week at your job and you would rather spend time with your family, then maybe you could cut back to 68 hours a week and spend that two extra hours with your family. The company is not going to fall apart because of your two hours. I thought the whole university would fall apart when I left. That was more than nine years ago. Turns out they're fucking up just like they always were. <laughs> I wasn't even a major player in that. We face an existential crisis. But we always have. As individuals, we always have. And those of you, mostly you, not so much me, because I'm a, I'm a little too young for it, but some people in this audience were probably taught to dive under their desk during the Cold War because the Soviets were going to launch a nuclear weapon and it would land on your head and all you have to do is crawl under your desk and you'll be fine. These are the kinds of things that make me question the intelligence of the average human being. A desk? A nuclear bomb? Hmm, could go either way. In any event, we face an existential threat, and we have before. And we all have from the moment we realize that we're mortal. That I, too, am going to die that any moment might be my last. And given the way I've lived, I'm surprised it hasn't happened already. You've all been teenagers. It's amazing you got through that. 
the certainty of my near-term death, and it's not because I'm particularly sick, I mean, beyond the whole mental health thing, and we don't even need to get into that, coupled with the absurdity of life for me, inspired by Camus, the absurdist philosopher, facilitates my living with urgency and with authenticity. I know who I am. It took me a long time to get here. Most people don't even think about it. It's the joke on campus, classes that ponder the meaning of life. I would point out to my students that there are many meanings of life and each of them is personal to you. And until you find your own meaning, why you're here, the rest is just fluff. And so you might want to think about that. What to do? I mentioned that, quoting Edward Abbey, action is the antidote to despair. What to do? One, remain calm. You all seem like relatively calm people. Nothing is under control. No thing is under your control. With a couple of very limited exceptions. But those bombs that were coming, that you were crawling under the desks for in the late 50s, early 1960s, none of that was under your control. Pulling the strings of empire today. Who gets this, who among us has their finger on the button that's gonna launch nuclear weapons to North Korea or Iraq or Iran, the trifecta of evil or whatever George W. Bush called it? None of us, none of us get to do that. We don't even get to vote in Congress, and those people we supposedly elect to vote for us in Congress, I don't think they know what the hell they're doing. And so, I don't think anything is under our control, except, and this is important, this is very, very important, except the only thing that's under our control is how we treat the people that we interact with on a daily or a weekly basis. So if you wake up in the morning beside the same person for a few years, you probably have some influence over how they're going to handle the day. If you begin and end every day by insulting them, by demeaning them, by pointing out that there are irrelevant specks on a speck on a speck that from an evolutionary and cosmological perspective, they're completely meaningless, that's probably not going to turn out well for you. I know this because I did that. You can learn from my mistakes. So we do have some control over the people in our lives. And most of that control is negative, so let's not do that. Instead, let's treat people like we, like we want to be treated ourselves. The old golden rule, right? I, pro I propose that we pursue excellence knowing that it's always beyond our reach, knowing that, as Nietzsche pointed out, we're flawed organisms, and we can't possibly achieve what we have in our dreams. And there will be no external rewards for this, by the way. Nobody's gonna give you a big raise because you're the most excellent person at your job. No, you, <laughs> that's, it's a good way to get demoted or to lose your job. For one thing, all your coworkers hate you because you're an overachiever pointing out that what they could be doing. And then your supervisor notices too, and he's like, can you not do that? All this will allow you to do, pursuing excellence in whatever you do in your life, all that allows you to do is look in the mirror at the end of the day and not be terribly embarrassed. I've had three or four days like that, it's pretty fun. I suggest all those, also the pursuit of love. It's small wonder then, when I suggest things like this, that my former academic colleagues in esteemed institutions spend so much of their time practicing character defamation and libel. Because what does this have to do with science? Everything. But that's a, that's a difficult jump for most natural scientists to make. I have more advice too. Follow your dog. When you take your dog on a walk in a park with four trees and a sun, your dog sees what's actually there. There's four trees and a sun. What do you see? Everything else. As you see last week and you see next month and you see the bills coming through the door. You don't even notice the four trees and the sun. Maybe you should spend more time acting like your dog. Just a suggestion. There's no money in that, by the way. 
We're all on a treadmill, and I'm not suggesting anybody jump off the treadmill. Because that's part of what we do, and we're all born into this set of living arrangements. In fact, we were born into civilization. We were born into captivity. But what we don't need to do is use the expectations of others to strengthen the cage. Be you. Everybody else is taken. Again, I'm not suggesting that we all jump off the treadmill. I think it's a bad idea. I think we need structure in our lives. I found out the hard way that I needed structure. I found out actually the hard way that I'm a teacher. It's not what I do, it's who I am. And I learned it only by walking away from a high pay, low work position where I was given a lot of money to do what I love to do. If you're doing what you love and you're doing it well, please keep going. So I get to this part, I've given all this advice as if I'm in a position to do that. And people ask me still, what do you mean? Specifically, what the hell are you doing? So, as if my life is an open book, I'm here to tell you what I'm doing. I'm trying to do those three things. I'm trying to exhibit calm, rational behavior. It's a rare day that I actually freak out loudly enough that people can hear me all over town. I'm trying to pursue excellence. I'm trying to do what I love. That's why I'm here. I try to mean, remain present with the people I'm with, with the jungle I live in, in Western Belize. I try to be grateful every day that I manage to be upright another day. As I'm getting older, I'm ever more grateful for that. Of course, more than almost anybody else on the planet, I discuss the unthinkable. We have a lot of visitors to our place in Western Belize. And then I go on the road and have the conversation extended with folks such as you. I'm researching symptoms and treatments for things like lethal wet bulb temperatures, what is bound to be a leading cause of death in the area where I live. So I want to know what it looks like when the people I'm pounding nails with are starting to experience organ failure because it's too hot and too humid. So I want to know what that looks like. Even if I can't do anything about it, and I can, most of the time, at some point I may not be able to, I still want to know that it's happening. I still want to be able to reach a diagnosis so that I know what's going on, even if I can't fix it. Then we know the situation is terminal, and it's malpractice if your doctor knows that the situation is terminal and doesn't tell you. And then, of course, I contemplate my own exit on a pretty regular basis, especially based on the feedback I get from presentations like this. <laughs> the bottom line is this. I'm encouraging people to live with urgency, to pursue excellence, to do what they love and do it well, to remain calm because nothing is under control, and also to realize that you're going to die. And in no case, in no case, well, you take your last breath and say, yeah, that's about enough of that. Have you ever known anybody who's done that? Nobody reaches their end of the life and goes, whew, glad that's over. Jeez, that was a slog, wasn't it? Glad I don't have another day of that crap. No, so someday we die. I learned when I was 11 that I too am going to die. It was a devastating moment and series of moments thereafter. But on all the other days, we won't. We don't. We get to live. It's really pretty astonishing. You saw how little time humans have been here on Earth. About 300,000 years. Contrast that with the 13.8 billion year old universe. And what you come up with is if the stretch of my arms represents the 13.8 billion year old universe, then the human experience is the last few cells at the end of that middle finger that I just scraped off. Oh, I'm sorry about that. We're here for a moment. And then at the level of the individual, 
That's at the level of the species. We're here for a few cells worth at the end of one by one finger. At the level of an individual, we're here for a blink of an eye. The world's oldest human being at the time, March 2015, was at her 117th birthday party and she, asked, she was asked, what's that like? You've had 117 years, what's that like? And she says, and I quote, it seemed rather short. <laughs> I'm afraid none of us here are gonna make it to 117 and it will seem rather short. To put a punctuation mark on her message, and apparently mine, she died a few weeks later. It seemed rather short. Thank you for your attention. I welcome your questions and comments and especially answers. Thank you very much.